you got to operate in truth, right? Operate in truth. You know, tell the truth. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Gator Truth Florida Football Podcast. I'm Daniel, and on today's episode, we're going to take a look at the game against the South Florida Bulls, have a few predictions, and I will also answer some questions sent in by you, the listeners. The game against the Bulls does kick off from Gainesville at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, and for my friends in New Mexico, that'll be about 5.30 your time. The Bulls come to town with a 1-1 one one record. They lost their first game to BYU 50-21. to If you're wondering how that game went, maybe it was close and then BYU pulled out at the end. That is not the case at all. BYU actually was up 38 to nothing and USF did not score until the end or right at the end of the first half. The game did finish 50 to 21 as we said. In that game, South Florida did give up a total of 573 yards to BYU. Their second game was against Howard and I'm sure many of you are curious based off of beating Howard 42-20, thinking it was probably the same thing in reverse from the BYU game where USF started off and really took it to Howard and then Howard scored some after USF was way up. Well, that's not quite the case. USF at the end of the first quarter actually trailed 7 to nothing and were only ahead 14 to 7 at the half. In fact, USF needed two Howard fumbles to set up both of their first half touchdowns, and in the game, 21 of their points were off of turnovers. Their longest drive in that game was 69 yards. Of course, as we spoke about in the preseason, USF's quarterback is Jerry Bohannon, who last year led the Baylor Bears to the Big 12 title. So there is talent at quarterback for USF. I don't believe that there's really talent anywhere else on that team, at least at this point, that could be a threat to Florida. Basically, yes, what I'm saying is this should be a Florida win. I'll get into things I want to see from this game in just a minute. But based off of what USF has done in the first two weeks of the season, the struggles that they've had, and listen, right now they are the 97th ranked offense in the nation. Granted, that is ahead of Kentucky's offense, who I believe is currently 112th. And they're also the 125th ranked defense in the nation. So this is perfect for a Florida team coming off a loss to gain some confidence back before the big road trip to Knoxville next weekend. Some keys that if USF is going to have a chance in this game, again, I don't see it happening, but just to give you some keys for them, They're going to need to cause us to turn the ball over even more than they caused Howard to turn the ball over. Like I said, 21 of their 42 points against Howard was based off of turnovers. We're going to need to play worse than we did it against Kentucky, where the two interceptions were the difference in that game. I don't foresee that happening, and I do think our defense, as it starts to learn, as it starts to adapt to where players can do best and what they can't do best, is going to be a problem for USF, and especially moving forward, I could see us try getting lots of rotation, getting lots of young guys' experience in this game. But for Florida, definitely the keys are establish the run, and that's what I do want to see first is us to establish the run. If we can do that, everything else flows from it. That gets me to the first thing I'd like to see us do. The first thing I'd like to see us do is establish the run game against USF. Because if we can establish that run game, maybe get one or two touchdowns in early from that run game with a little bit of passes sprinkled in, then that will take pressure off of the offense because we're not you know, trying to force it or necessarily feel like we have a lower margin for error that can open us to try and work on some of the passing game. Like I've said, I know other podcasters have said a lot of the passes we missed Last week, our passes we've seen Anthony Richardson hit. We saw him hit him when he led us on four straight touchdown drives against LSU. We've seen them 
hit against Utah. We saw some amazing throws last year against USF in Tampa. So whatever was going on last week, hopefully that has been exercised for this week. But just to help out with some of the mental aspect of it, get us a few scores on the ground and then begin working on the passing game. That way we can get a little bit of confidence going for our trip to Knoxville. Another thing that I want to see is get AR, once we do that, try and get them around the 250 passing yards um, because that would really, I believe that's a good number to build his confidence. Maybe go for one or two long shots, try and build that uh, into our game and also something to put on tape for Tennessee. A lot of this game I really do think does have to be viewed with the lens of what can we work on towards Tennessee. Maybe not tip our hand too much, but if there's a few things we can put on film that they feel they need to account for, that will definitely help us out when we get up there. For the defense, one number I'd like to see is at least three sacks. This defense did well. Lots of pressure on Will Levis last week. This is an even worse offense. Again, the 125th ranked, um, well, 97th ranked offense. I'm sorry, their defense is 125th ranked. Um, anyways, the 97th ranked offense in the nation, and I do think that we can take advantage of their line, get a few sacks, pause pressure. I want to see us cover those tight ends from the beginning, doing it well. As we spoke about on Monday, or I recorded on Monday as it was released on Tuesday, their tight ends, five catches, 70 yards for Kentucky in the first quarter in a few minutes. Let's not have that quarter in a few minutes this week. I don't think anyone's quite as talented on USF's team, obviously, but let's not leave it to that. Let's start playing like we did the last two and three quarters of a quarter last week where we took Will Levis from a guy who was throwing 9 for 10 for 143 yards down to the guy who completed 4 for 14 and about 50-some-odd yards for well over a half. In the end, I do not believe that Florida gets the shutout in this game. I just have a feeling that we'll allow a big play, or when we finally get our backups in, we get to see lots of rotation, that USF might get a score in there somewhere. So I'll believe we win this 49-7. to I don't think we'll score higher just because the amount of running this offense likes to do. I believe it's going to limit the number of possessions. I think we'll still get plenty of possessions, but it will be a lower score than maybe what some people think we could do against this team. BYU putting up 50. We could probably put up 60 something if we wanted I believe but however again I think our running game really limits that and that is fine the important thing like I said I want to see is getting AR's confidence back up put some things on film for Tennessee to look at at least on our offense and for our defense let's get those three sacks let's not allow them to get in a rhythm throwing the ball since they do have a quarterback who's won a power five conference championship and if we can do that, this will be a nice, fun game to enjoy in the swamp. If you don't have tickets and you are available to go, this would be a good one to take your kids to. This would be a good game where you may not have to fully focus in. You can have friends, joke around. This won't be an intense game like the last two. So if you're available, definitely come support the team. As I say every week, Make this the atmosphere that you would want to play in if you were a recruit. I, I know it's not the biggest of games, but still give our recruits coming in, and we do have some, that atmosphere that they want to see and think, I want to be a part of this. With that said, let's go ahead and move on to some of the questions you've given me on Twitter, through direct message or even through a text message for one or two. The first question I have is from Twitter name Sandy Derrick. That is at Deacon Sandman. He asks, Why is the orange helmet, blue jersey, and orange pants the best uniform combo? And 
how do you help those who disagree with that fact understand they're wrong? Well, I'm sorry. I believe that the orange-blue-orange combo is, in fact, not the best combo. And I'd be happy if I never saw that combo again. I'll be honest. Growing up, playing the NCAA football game, I would love to wear that combo. However, I am kind of a superstitious sports fan. I know uniforms don't give you results, but there's also times where you have things like the announcer's jinx and other things. So I'd rather not tempt fate, even though, again, uniforms do not impact the results of a game. When I think of the orange, blue, orange, I can only think of four times we wore the orange, blue, orange. And if someone knows of another time, please feel free to write me. Possibly Gators Uniform Tracker can tell us. But the orange, blue, orange were the 89 FSU game, 99 FSU game, the Sugar Bowl after the 2012 season, and I believe it was the 2016 game against North Texas. We were 1-3 and three in those games, and our quarterback in 2016, who at that time he was looking pretty decent, Luke Del Rio, got his knee messed up in that one win where we beat North Texas. So, again, being a semi-superstitious sports fan, don't give me the orange-blue-orange. However, something I'd like to see, something that we have never worn, although Montreal Johnson did do it in the spring game, is orange tops, blue bottoms. Whether that is orange helmets with that or blue helmets with that, I really don't care. I thought it looked good when Malik Davis was wearing the orange top, blue bottoms as a recruit back in 2016. I said, Man, that looked good. I hope we see it for a game sometime. I think it looks good. We'll see. I know some people have disagreed with me. Point is, Sandy Derrick, although you've asked, how do I help those who disagree with that fact understand they're wrong? I'm not going to understand I'm wrong. In fact, I think in this case, you're wrong. But thank you for being a listener. Thank you for your question. Hopefully, we can have some fun with this as the season and seasons go on. I'm sure that Q&A question right there is probably the hottest take I've had on this podcast. Maybe not. I'm sure I'm going to get some sort of text message or direct message letting me know what someone thinks about that. Moving on, at Cap Spacely on Twitter sent me a question of who is the most underrated Gator of all time and who is the most overrated Gator of all time. I'm going to say this. I will try hard not to bash any of our Gators or try and stay as far from it as possible as long as I can. And with that said, I'm not going to do an overrated Gator because there's no way that just doesn't come out as negative. If I think of a way to do that later, I promise you I will give you that answer. But for the question of who is the most underrated Gator of all time, and I'm sure that some people are going to disagree and say, how is he underrated? I'll explain why. Probably the most underrated Gator, in my opinion, of all time, is Chris Leak. Many of you may say, well, he was a national championship quarterback. How are you saying he's underrated? Well, if I were to ask many people to name the top five Florida QBs of all time, our all-time leading passer, Chris Leak, I guarantee you probably wouldn't make that top five for anyone. And I'm sure there's lots of debate whether you can put him there or not. But for a guy who committed to UF saying he was going to get UF back to a national title, got UF back to the national title, something that he said when he committed to us and followed through, that is amazing. Going through the ups and downs of multiple coordinators throughout the years, multiple coaches throughout the years. Again, our all-time leading passer and handled a lot of pressure in situations with dignity. Whatever may or may not have happened after Florida, that's not part of this discussion. But if we're talking about an underrated Gator, I'm going to give it to a quarterback who, if, again, we ask most people their top five UF quarterbacks, a national title winning quarterback probably would not be in that discussion. We'd probably hear, of course, Werfel. We'd, of course, hear Tebow probably hear lots of Trask, and then you get into 
what about Spurrier or Kerwin Bell or Shane Matthews, Rex Grossman, and several other players would probably get named before him. For that reason, I'm going to go with Chris Leak as the most underrated Gator of all time. I'm sure I'm missing people. I think Eric Rett may be there as well as our all-time leading rusher. But when people are just asked about some of the great rushers of all time, they'll talk about players that were on the national championship teams, or they'll talk about Emmett Smith. And I think Rett's name does get forgotten in the discussion sometimes, which I believe is unfortunate in this situation. Moving on to the next question, a guy who I've gotten to speak to quite a bit recently, Gator Josh O1, who will be in the swamp for this game against South Florida. He asked, if seniority didn't matter and assuming everyone knew the entire playbook, what would be our best offensive line lineup? And I know I've kind of paraphrased some of that question, Josh, but I'll go and answer. For our passing game, I do believe it'd be the pretty much the same 11 personnel that we've seen, the same offensive line, AR at quarterback. For now, until I see more out of some of the younger receivers and see that they've proven themselves, I do believe Hendo, Pearsall, and Shorter are the best three we have. Shorter is some of our most sure hands when he gets it on the ball. Pearsall has shown some quickness and speed. And Hendo has been solid. We can argue that he had a drop or two last game, but overall he has been solid. When we see more from the younger receivers, that may change for me. I do think right now that Travis Etienne is our best running back. And as far as the passing game, I would put Keon Zipper at the tight end spot. Again, this is for 11 personnel, which is five linemen, one tight end, one quarterback, one running back, and three receivers. For a running situation, I do believe that's where we go to 12 personnel. In that case, I would probably have Xanders come in as the second tight end because 12 personnel is one running back with two tight ends. I would probably have Xanders coming in and taking Hendo off the field. The reason why I'd take Hendo off the field, even though it's a running situation and he might be a little bit better of a blocker than Pearsall, is it opens up for the um, play action game. Having a guy as quick as Pearsall, maybe that gets us in a play action situation where we can hit a deep ball, or maybe that gets us in a position where sometimes Billy likes his uh, players running routes, even though it's a running play. So with his routes, that can disorientate at least one of the corners who's on them and possibly draw the vision of a safety who moves out of position to make a play on a running back. That's what I'd say for that. I'll also give you this freebie. There's a line that I think would be great if we know we want to run it, and we're just like, hey, try and stop us. This is what I call the beat you up lineup, and this is getting our biggest big uglies, our biggest offensive line on the field. I would put Waits and Herman at the tackles, By all accounts, these guys can run block, and what they're working on, developing on, is their pass blocking. Both Waits and Herman at tackle are 370 apiece. At guards, I would have Braun and Osiris Torrance, who are 350 apiece. And then Ethan White's played some center. He's about 330. I would put him at center. That would be a massive offensive line and something that would be hard to deal with. And it's pretty much the We're going to run the ball. You can't stop us. And along with that, just if we're putting size out there for the tight ends, this is a 12 personnel. So I'd have Griffin McDowell, who I believe is listed in the 280s at tight end. And also Xanders out there listed at 265. Along with AR, that's where I'd put Montreal Johnson, who's more of a power back in there. And then I'd have Shorter and Hendo because Shorter is going to be blocking a DB 10 yards down the field. And I believe Hendo is the better blocker than Pearsall. Do I think we ever see that lineup? Of course not. But would it be fun to see this massive O line just run blocking and pushing people down the field and seeing if they could stop it? I think that would be a lot of fun. Mark from Atlanta writes What were your first away game experiences? Well, my first two away games I ever got to experience, I didn't do much uh, growing up until I was about 16. 
And that's where I got to see the 03 Miami game, which also is known as the Miami Meltdown, where we came to a massive lead and then blew it at the end. Um, a funny story from that is my mom, my brother, my dad and I, we drove down to Miami. My dad started feeling bad right before the game. Doesn't travel to the Orange Bowl with us. Yes, this game was in the old Orange Bowl. For those of you that may not know that existed or may just know it from high, old highlights or whatnot, we step over a large pile of trash just to get into the stadium. It was not the best stadium ever, for sure. And I remember going in, we watch the game. Of course, we blow the game, we lose. But we get back to the hotel and we walk in. My dad had been asleep. He wakes up and he says to us, man, that was quite a great game, wasn't it? And we're like, no, no, it wasn't. Turns out he fell asleep in the third quarter when we still had a lead and could not believe it took us a while to convince him that we actually lost that game. So that was the first home game experience. Um, the second one kind of made up for it. Uh, the second one was the 2004 FSU game, uh, also known as the Ron Zook Field game. We had gotten two tickets because of how bad the 2003 game was against FSU. Yes, we had the meltdown in Miami in 2003, but we also had the swindle in the swamp. Look it up for those of you that are newer to the program or younger listeners. And I just wanted to see us get our revenge on FSU. We had some tickets and then some people that sit around us uh, at the games in Gainesville decided, hey, we're not going. It's been a bad season. Ron Zook's been fired. Here, have other tickets. So then we ended up having more of us go to that game. And of course, we end up upsetting FSU. Ronza gets carried off the field. One of the coolest away games that you could have at Florida. I got to be there for it. So it was a magical night. Funny story from that as well is we had a hotel in Live Oak. We took a wrong turn trying to find the hotel. Next thing we know, we had gone from I-10 down through some highways, ended back up at 75. And instead of turning around to find this hotel, which was now probably 30, 45 minutes behind us, we drove the rest of the way home, didn't get home till 4.30, 5, 5.30 in the morning. Paper had already been delivered. So before going to bed, I read the recap of the game in the Orlando Sentinel that day. Just one of the most unique experiences I've ever had with Gator football. One last question here. It is Eric from Claremont, Florida, and he asks, why are the episodes only 30 minutes? You seem to be married to this 30-minute runtime. Well, Eric, what I can say to you is that when I was workshopping this and talking around other people about uh, doing this podcast, a lot of feedback I got from some of my friends over at Gator Chatter was, we prefer shorter podcasts, keeping around 30 minutes. Although we enjoy some of the longer podcasts and longer episodes, we'd prefer to see something shorter. So I was like, hey, there are lots of longer ones out there. I'll try and be a little bit shorter. And things like this week, it ends up meaning I have multiple episodes in a week, but that does allow me to do a little bit more Q&A. So thank you for your question. Um, hopefully, if anyone else had that question of why does it seem like sometimes things are rushed, lots of things in 30 minutes, well, that is why, because I workshopped an idea, got feedback, and I do listen to feedback. Um, if you got any, always feel free to hit me up on Twitter. You can also shoot me an email at GatorTruth133 at gmail.com. Also, haven't said it for a few episodes, do check out the Gator Collective. If you have not become a member, help name, image, and likeness become a strength at the University of Florida as the recruiting wars seem to be turning on name, image, and likeness. For those of you that have not signed up to the Gator Collective, what it is, it's a way for our athletes to make money on their name, image, and likeness. How do they do that? Exclusive interviews, special events. I know the Gator Collective has had at least one big tailgate the Friday before the Utah game. I know they had an event in Winter Park, Florida, not too long ago, where Anthony Richardson, I believe Rashad Torrance II, and others were there signing autographs, uh, food was had, good times were had by all. So definitely check out the Gear Collective. Again, there's exclusive podcasts, player interviews, and different access to the team as you've never seen before. 
because they were not allowed to make money off their name, image, and likeness. And again, it does help out with our recruiting. I also want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen. If you've got any cool stories about Gator football and your experience, please, please reach out to me. Tell me. I love to hear them. The great thing about college football is it is something that ties so many people from so many different backgrounds all together, gives us one thing to cheer for and gives us a bit of community. And those stories are that part of the community. So it's always a cool thing to hear. Um, Definitely, again, check us out on Twitter at Gator Podcast. Check out our YouTube page. I do hope to have more content on that page as the season goes on. I do upload videos from the games, videos like the Gator Walk, player entrances, things of that nature. And I hope to get some extra videos coming soon. Also, please continue to share our podcast. Our podcast's biggest week was last week ever. So thank you for everyone who shared, everyone that's downloaded episodes, quote tweeted, retweeted, anything you've done. Thank you very much. It does mean a lot. Hopefully we are getting better with each episode. And hopefully we continue to get better for you. And if you have any questions that you would like maybe us to answer, any fun questions, feel free to send them to us, whether it's, again, a direct message at Gator Podcast on Twitter, or whether it's an email to GatorTruth133 at gmail.com. Again, thank you, everyone, for listening. And as always, Go Gators! Go Gators!